ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन ओके सो टूडेज टॉपिक इज एनर्जी रिसोर्सेज नाउ दिस अगेन इज अ वेरी बिग टॉपिक आई एम ओनली इन एज मच टाइम इज वी हैव वी कैन प्रॉबली ओनली हैव एन ओवर व्यू बट आई एम गोइंग टू मे बी डिस्कस सम ऑफ द कन्वेंशनल एनर्जीज द एसोसिएटेड रिस्क विद दैम एंड द डिप्लीशन दैट वी आर फेसिंग द रिलेटेड ग्लोबल वार्मिंग प्रॉब्लम and uh, i'm going to uh, maybe share with you a few good ideas uh, which are uh, we don't know really we uh, it's hard to say at this point you know um, how the uh, world's uh, energy systems are going to which direction they are going to take uh, we'll have to wait and see but uh, there are some very good ideas and which i thought i'd uh, share with you so hopefully you'll um, you you like at least some of them okay so this is the outline um i the the, the first uh, topic is uh, units and terms uh, because i i understand that uh, many of the environmental science teachers are are not from uh, an engineering background and then it's a little hard for them to uh, navigate through the various uh, units and the terms that are used so um i have tried to uh, collect a bunch of uh, the commonly used uh, terms uh, the terminology as well as the units Uh, and uh, hopefully this this will be a place you can uh, go to whenever you are confused uh, but again on the, uh, on the uh, open internet you have uh, you have all these uh, various uh, conversion tools and what not so uh, really that's not a big problem okay so uh, i have uh, and i'm not going to go through all these uh, slides but i'll just explain to you that there are these energy units uh, there are power units uh there are um, heating values of uh, fuels and then there is the higher heating value and the lower heating value that may not be very uh, relevant to uh, people uh, who um, are not from the mechanical sciences uh, so people who are from computer science background or um, biotechnology and all that may may find these uh, terms and uh, things not so relevant but anyway i still have it over there then there is uh, the energy content you know all these fossil fuels they have a certain energy content so we'd like to know uh, you know per unit mass how much energy they can give so i have uh, listed um, by by fuel uh, what is the heating values of uh, these fuels and then uh, there is uh, also a list of uh, the carbon content of various fuels so in in other words uh, th this also is kind of important because uh if you take coal for instance which has which is mostly carbon um to generate the same amount of energy if you are using coal then you would be emitting more co2 whereas uh, in if you were using methane to generate the same amount of energy you would be emitting less carbon dioxide so the choice even within the fossil fuels in general all fossil fuels are bad for global warming but within them uh, you know choosing between coal and natural gas there is quite a significant difference because you see uh, with natural gas methane uh, it is about 14 uh, metric tons of carbon per terajoule whereas for coal it is 25 so that's quite a significant difference maybe uh, people who are uh, in the field of engineering they can explain these things you you could read through uh, these slides and then explain to your students some relevant aspects okay the second um, topic which actually is beginning of this um, discussion is uh, the energy resources that we currently depend upon and uh, what are the uh, how much of these resources exist uh, what are the um, risks associated with using them and uh, the fact that being mostly fossil fuels they are going to get depleted so what are the timelines uh, when we can expect their depletion at a certain rate so um, getting into this discussion uh, this is stuff that you probably learnt in school uh, there are uh, renewable resources and non renewable resources uh, renewable resources are those which actually get exhausted but can be replenished by natural processes uh, solar and wind are not renewable in that sense they are perpetual they are always there they don't get exhausted and then replenished fresh water is an example of something that gets depleted but gets replenished or or biomass wood for instance 
uh, is renewable because wood grows okay you can you can uh, harvest some wood and then it gets exhausted temporarily and then it grows back so that is renewable uh, so that's why i have three categories over here i have perpetual or continuous in which you know solar wind geothermal they come into that and then the renewable which is uh, something that gets depleted but over a, a time span uh, that is short enough co as compared to the human lifespan over a short enough period they get uh, renewed and then there are the non renewable resources which takes uh, which uh, fossil fuels in that sense you can say that uh, they are also renewable but it takes uh, millions of years to get renewed so over a, a, a compared to the human life span uh, they are they are non renewable so it turns out that we are having this discussion because uh, we are in the middle of a global energy crisis which is worsening day by day and how do we define the crisis crisis means we are we are trapped there's no easy way out so uh, in order to uh, explain this i have uh, put together a few points which uh, in in my opinion adequately uh, summarize the situation we are in uh, the first point is that we uh, we have a near total dependence on fossil fuels which are unsustainable energy sources and then there are other unsustainable energy sources also so we uh, humanity has a near total dependence on these unsustainable energy sources now the use of these uh, uh, resources, uh, these non-renewable, unsustainable uh, uh, energy sources, is leading to an irreversible damage to Earth's uh, life support system. So, what what is the Earth's life support system? The uh, sense in which I use this phrase over here is um, related to the the very beginning when I uh, spoke about sustainable development and the Gaia theory. So, these um, various uh, interacting systems which uh, maintain uh, the uh, the biosphere and enable us to en uh, provide all the environmental functions to us so it is that earth's life support system that i'm uh, uh, i'm referring to uh, so use of these unsustainable energy sources is uh, causing irreversible damage to that uh, support system and uh, as manifestations of that uh, of those impacts on nature we are we are seeing global warming uh, various kinds of pollution the related health problems and what not now um, these unsustainable energy sources uh, it is not that they are going to last forever being uh, non renewable they are going to get exhausted so there are there, some of them some of these reserves are severely depleted and uh, many of them are um, going to get depleted over a, a matter of uh, several decades it is it is very obvious that we cannot rely on these uh, forms for too long now to add to this the uh, rate of consumption of energy is increasing at an alarming rate the the demand is increasing and in order to uh, meet that demand if we have to extract more and more of these already depleting sources uh, then we are in a very uh, precarious situation uh, again if you use those energy resources uh, then we are we are risking uh, not only faster depletion but we are also certainly going to face um, very serious environmental impacts you may you may say that okay this by itself is not a problem because many renewable or environmentally friendly uh, forms of energy do exist agreed they do exist but presently their uh, their share in the energy portfolio is is very less uh, in other words uh, we are using hardly maybe uh, less than a percent or so of uh, renewable energy forms and uh, more of the non renewable this is basically a, a summary slide and in the in the following uh, slides uh, i will only add detail to this discussion uh, let's get into it the the first point was that we have a near total dependence on uh, environmentally unsustainable um, technologies so this uh, this is the world energy consumption by source uh, this is 2012 data which is recent enough and you see that uh, we the fossil fuel dependence is something like uh, 87% percent. and um, you know there are relatively smaller shares of uh, nuclear hydro and um, some other renewable sources 
So, uh, coal, oil, natural gas form the major uh, share. If you look at India, the, the scene is not very different. We again have a major dependence on fossil fuels uh, up to 91 percent. And so, over, over here is the primary energy consumption. Over here is India's power generation. So, which source of energy uh, we use to generate our electricity. So, uh, it is again uh, very uh, heavily dominated by the fossil fuels. You have coal, um, coal having a 60 percent share and uh, then a, a little bit of the others. Now, um, I am showing uh, this, uh, this slide to emphasize the fact that uh, the electrification rate in India is low. It means that there is the, the demand for electricity is, uh, is very high and it is going to rise. Uh, the overall electrification rate being 65 uh, odd percent, maybe the, the, the data may be a few years out of date, uh, but I think it still uh, conveys the message. It means that our demand is going to increase. So, if we have to generate more electricity, it means we have to, uh, going back one slide, we have to depend more on these environmentally damaging technologies. Now, for what do we use the electricity? Once the electricity is generated in India, uh, what do we use it for? It turns out that uh, we, are, we are using it for uh, mainly for industry, uh, domestic and agriculture. So, these are the main uh, end use sectors of electricity uh, in India. Uh, the commercial sector is relatively small and then 7 percent is other. So, uh, it, it means that these are all, all very essential areas in which the electricity is being used. It is not like we are using it for something that is non-essential. So, uh, the electricity is being used for essential uh, things and uh, that demand is going to rise and uh, we depend in a major way on fossil fuels. So, meeting that demand directly means more and more consumption of these fossil fuels. This is just some detail, but maybe uh, of interest to uh, some people and maybe to uh, engineers. Uh, there is a, um, I am going to introduce uh, the term of the base load uh, energy and uh, peaking energy. The, the electricity grid is the uh, electrical distribution system. Uh, which, uh, which supplies electricity to all of us. Now, uh, that is supplied by electricity uh, through various sources. So, you may have a hydroelectric station, a nuclear power plant, a coal fired power plant, a gas fired power plant, all of them are connected to the same grid, all of them are supplying to the same grid and then we are, uh, we are consuming that electricity from the grid. So, um, there needs to be a certain, uh, certain steady generation. Now, coal and nuclear uh, very, very ably provide that base load energy and in some parts of the day and I am going to show you with, with graphs uh, a little while later, uh, at some po points in the day there is an extra need for energy. So, that extra need for energy for a short duration is provided by what are called as peaking plants. So, these are, uh, these are plants which will be turned on only for a certain amount of time. Uh, in order to meet that demand. So, uh, the base load energy deficit in India on an average is 5.1 percent, but it varies uh, in, the, in the southern grid it is about 12 percent, in the northeastern grid it is about uh, 17 percent for the base load and, and for peaking, the peaking shortage on an average is 2 percent, uh, but again in the southern grid uh, peaking shortage is very high and um, in the northeast also it is pretty high. So, it varies from region to region, some places are, are, are uh, well off and the others are not so well off. So, this graph shows how the energy demand in India is increasing and this is also representative of many, uh, many countries in the world. So, world over the trend is similar. Coming back to that summary slide, I, I told you that uh, these, if we are depending on fossil fuels, then there are, um, there is a risk of depletion. Um, for fossil fuels, uh, see fossil, nuclear and hydropower are the conventional uh, sources. Now, fossil fuels uh, are, we know they are non-renewable and oil is depleting very rapidly. There is some, some concept called as peak oil, which I will just show you in a moment. Uh, and uh, for coal, uh, mining, uh, coal mining comes with very serious impacts and then there is the 
the fly ash and the bottom ash waste problem uh, apart from global warming. So, there are so many uh, problems, but coal again is, um, is also limited in quantity although it is much more compared to oil. Now, uranium also is limited, thorium uh, will last somewhat longer. Uh, reprocessing is a great idea, it can create more nuclear fuel. Uh, and, and make the available uh, reserves, uh, fissile uh, reserves last much longer. Fusion technology we know is quite distant yet. Hydropower, the, the issues are that um, many large dams have already been constructed, many of these uh, river systems, uh, they already have many dams and more, more dams, uh, many more dams might not be possible, maybe a few more dams uh, would be possible, but maybe uh, not in a very big way because of the social impacts. The, the sad part is we cannot even consume the remaining fossil fuel. So, you may say that okay, uh, if, if, we, if the reserves of fossil fuels are depleting, at least let us enjoy while it lasts. Uh, even that is not going to work out because if we, uh, if we try to consume uh, the existing reserves of these fossil fuels, it is going to um, harm the environment uh, and lead to a lot of other social problems also. So, what are, what are those issues? So, again for fossil fuels problems which are pretty well known are the greenhouse uh, gas emissions and climate change. Uh, there is also pollution of air, land and water particularly with coal mining, uh, there is a lot of pollution problem. What are the issues with nuclear? You have major accidents which are very rare, but but when they, when they happen, they are extremely scary. Um, there are minor accidental releases of radioactive materials, then there is a nuclear waste problem and then there are the costs of decommissioning and cleanup. So, when things do happen, uh, it is a major cleanup that is required uh, and then old reactors have to be decommissioned. So, that again is uh, an issue. Uh, with hydropower, uh, the risks and the costs uh, include uh, land submersions. I, I yesterday I mentioned about uh, disruption of uh, riverine ecosystems and floodplain ag agriculture. The ousties, uh, the people who are ousted or basically asked to go from their land, uh, those people, uh, not all of them get compensated, particularly if they are not landowners. If they are not landowners, then uh, the government does not compensate them adequately or has not historically uh, has not compensated them adequately. And this is not only in India, but all over the world. As a result, you will find uh, these major public agitations. And there are, uh, if you go to YouTube, there are uh, very, very moving videos on um, the, the condition of these uncompensated austies. The, the people were uh, people staged uh, satyagrahas and they um, you know basically they were ready to drown themselves uh, when the dam waters uh, rose. So, really really pathetic to watch. So, we have to be a little sensitive about that I, uh, development is important, but uh, development at somebody else's cost is is not development really. Okay. So, uh, th that was a summary I will quickly take a, uh, a short uh, run through uh, fossil fuels and, and what, what are their issues specifically. So, um, how do we use fossil fuels? We use it in uh, mainly three ways. Uh, the first one is you burn the fossil fuel in an engine, I mean you create rotary motion and, and you um, can use it either for transportation or for uh, generating electricity at a, uh, on a small scale. The second use is that you, you burn the fuel for heat, for heating applications. And the third one is you make, you heat it, make steam in a boiler, rotate turbines, operate generators, generate electrical energy and distribute it um, via the grid. So, these are the common ways that we use uh, fossil fuels. Now, very large amounts of electricity can be generated once the entire infrastructure has been set up. So, uh, the for let us say from the coal mine, uh, the railway tracks are laid to the thermal power plant, then you know the mining uh, will, will continuously supply um, the fuel necessary for the plant and then it can be in operation you know 24 7. So, once everything is set up, it is quite reliable and transporting uh, coal 
oil and gas there are there are different modes uh, gas can be transported through pipelines as well as uh, uh, compressed uh, tanks and what not. But once all the infrastructure is, uh, is developed then it is a fairly reliable system, fairly reliable and uh, you get good quality power, it is not unreliable. So uh, how does it all begin? Uh, in the case of petroleum you get crude oil and that is deep within the earth's crust and that is extracted. Uh, some there may be uh, it can either be on land or there may be offshore uh, oil rigs and you extract the oil there are uh, lots of refining steps that happen uh, to finally yield the the fuel that we use like petrol or diesel or whatnot now it turns out that the oil reserves are uh, are depleting so i had mentioned the depletion risks uh, there is something this con concept called as the peak oil crisis so what is that uh, when uh, so the the curve in the in the dark line that you see the bell shaped kind of curve uh, also known as the hubbard curve is um, is the total uh, daily oil production for a uh, and it is it is plotted against time so number of years what you see in in the uh, slightly fainter lines are the is the production from each individual well so this curve can be plotted for a region or it can be plotted for the entire world and each individual well once once it is dug it starts producing and it gives a stable production for several years and then its production kind of declines but by then a new well is drilled and that produces and then its production declines if you add up all of these uh, all these uh, the production from each individual well then what you get is is this curve uh, this curve uh, looks more or less symmetrical so if you are at this peak it means that half the oil on the left hand side which existed half the oil reserve of that region has been already exhausted and then on the production is going to decline so if the production is going to decline we know that world over energy demand is only increasing it's not uh, there are no signs of it reducing so if the if the global energy demand is increasing and your supply suddenly reduces then what's going to happen is high prices so uh, we might be at this peak some say we are, we will probably reach it shortly some say some studies say that we have already passed it and some say that we are near about the peak so whichever the case may be in, in the future the production is not going to be that high there may be arguments on how long it may last uh, but I do not think there is fundamentally an argument uh, of whether or not it is going to last forever. So this is actual data on the left hand side and it is classified by uh, the fuel type so this shows a similar uh, uh, curve what is what is on the right side of this dotted line and the year 2004 what is on the right side of that is projected so uh, on the left hand side is uh, is the actual data okay now these uh, burning of these fossil fuels uh, we know that is increasing um, the co2 emissions leading to climate change and uh, we will have a, a separate session on climate change uh, by another uh, faculty member this is just a general uh, graph showing which are the major oil producers and which are consumers. So you take Saudi Arabia for instance, uh, the, um, the, the maroon or, or, or brown bar indicates uh, its consumption and the grey bar indicates its uh, production. So Saudi Arabia uh, produces a lot of oil and consumes relatively uh, a smaller part. Um, on the contrary you take a country like India it produces a small quantity of oil but uses a much larger quantity of oil so which means that the rest of the oil uh, has to be imported. So this curve and the next even this one discusses about which countries have so far historically which are the countries which have been emitting um, the maximum quantity of um, greenhouse gases and uh, it, it turns out that uh, the cumulative emissions from 1751 to 2009 uh, 
uh, US has is the is probably the single largest share uh, in in the greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, Europe is also a, a, a quite a significant quantity, and uh, then China is is also big. Compared to that, India historically over this this time time period has not emitted significantly. But things are changing now. Uh, now, um, if you take only 2009 the annual emissions, then you see that China's share is bigger than US, and uh, India's share is also much larger. So, uh, in in future, it is going to be uh, assuming that the uh, the developed countries. Will uh, will not consume uh, much more energy, but the developing countries are are going to consume a lot of energy, uh, and uh, the the demand is going to continue to rise. So far, the way it is that India's per capita CO2 emission is very low. So if you look at the per capita, and then even projected uh, to 2030, the per capita emission of CO2 is very low. Uh, compare it with the United States, where uh, the the per capita CO2 emission is very very high. I mean, I, I mean, it's several times of uh, that of India. Uh, but but again, we must remember that uh, you know India's uh, consumption is uh, is low, but uh, a large uh, chunk of the population is below the poverty line. So if all of them have to have to come up uh, above the uh, poverty line, and if even the middle class has aspirations to uh, consume more and more, uh, then, then th this might not hold, you know, it, it, it might, it might uh, increase. And we have a very large population compared to, uh, compared to the United States. So, if having such a large population, the multiplying factor is very large. So, the total emissions will be significant then. Okay, so, if this oil, we know uh, about the peak oil crisis and oil being uh, limited and it might run out. So, uh, why not turn to coal? There is plenty of coal. Yes, there is plenty of coal. It has high energy content. It is an energy dense fuel. Uh, in other words, in within a kilogram of coal, there is a lot of energy. Um, it is easy to transport and things like that. Now, there are newer technologies like clean coal uh, technology, gasification, uh, re reformation that are coming up which reduce the pollution to a large extent. But uh, coal is associated with, with many socio environmental problems. Uh, this is a, uh, a photograph of a coal mine uh, in Bihar and you see how it has completely destroyed the land. I mean it is a huge crater, an ugly huge crater uh, where uh, once there was a forest. So, uh, these open pit mines uh, are are a major environmental problem. There are uh, the, the, the closed pit mines where you, you have a, you drill a shaft down and then you have these horizontal tunnels in which the, the mine workers go in and then they extract the coal. Uh, so, they are, they are somewhat better, but then they are also prone to accidents because methane tends to accumulate in, in those uh, tunnels and then uh, even, even a, a pickaxe uh, hit on uh, um, on the mineral can uh, ignite the uh, methane and lead to a very serious accident. Okay, uh, coal obviously is associated with uh, very high emissions of uh, carbon dioxide and um, in, in the uh, very um, early slides that I showed you, the, the carbon content of coal is very high. So, for the same amount of uh, energy output, uh, coal will emit more carbon, uh, carbon dioxide as compared to uh, diesel or petrol or natural gas. So, according to some uh, projections, it may last about 50, 60 years uh, if the current acceleration in its use uh, continues. It uh, leads to lot of uh, uh, environmental damage and pollution uh, from uh, even heavy metals and some radioactive materials also. Uh, if the sulfur content of uh, coal uh, of a particular uh, coal is uh, high, then it can lead to acid rain. There are uh, instances where the ground water and surface waters have also been polluted very significantly leading to lots of health problems for people around. The fly ash and the bottom ash again are a 
major concern. The coal fired power plants have been associated with lots of um, diseases and uh, deaths of uh, many people. So, as I said, uh, you know, flue, uh, flue gas uh, desulfurization that is removal of the, uh, of the sulfur oxides from the uh, exhaust. So, all these are, are good technologies, uh, clean coal technologies, they are, they are uh, good, but again you cannot uh, hide from the fact that uh, invariably you are going to emit carbon dioxide. The carbon sequestration is uh, definitely a good idea, but uh, again it has to work out and uh, for uh, for some sequestration technologies, what is the the long term uh, stability of that sequestration? For if it is geological sequestration, I mean, what's the guarantee that it's not going to uh, come out one fine day? Uh, what if there is an earthquake? And earthquakes keep happening. We recently had uh, earthquakes in Nepal, so uh, I'm I'm a bit concerned about that. Okay, so if uh, coal is bad, then what about natural gas? Natural gas is supposed to be clean. Uh, yes, it's it's quite clean. Um, it, it once upon a time it was wasted during oil drilling because when you drill for oil and um, the the natural gas which is accumulated in uh, geologic formations uh, that escapes out and then there is uh, where you drill um, is uh, that place may be far away from uh, where energy is required. So there's no easy way to transport the natural gas to uh, to the place where it can be used and as a result it was just simply let out or flared. Uh, flaring is just igniting uh, that, uh, that gas and simply burning it away. So, so flaring is better than simply re releasing methane because methane is a very potent uh, greenhouse gas. So converting that methane into um, carbon dioxide is, uh, is better, but uh, the best thing is to use it uh, rather than simply waste that energy. Um, now, uh, there are public transportation vehicles that are required to run on compressed natural gas. That is a, a good step. It is a positive step. Some slight issues with um, natural gas are that its energy density is somewhat lower than, um, um, definitely lower than coal, uh, lower than uh, petrol and diesel. Uh, that is not such a significant problem with some minor modifications the vehicles can still run on it. Uh, nitrogen oxide emissions continue to be a problem uh, and the gas reserves again will probably last around 60 years uh, according to some estimates. But as I said uh, the uh, global warming uh, potential exists from two sources. One is after combustion uh, natural gas is carbon dioxide is obviously released to the atmosphere, but even, uh, even before um, uh, combustion, there are always leaks uh, through pipelines and during handling some accidental leaks uh, that, that happen. So, if um, there is a, uh, if uh, natural gas becomes the fuel of choice, there is going to be some leak from uh, those sources which affects uh, the uh, earth's climate. Okay, now, we have basically gone through most of the fossil fuels, the, the, at least the major ones. Um, then uh, there, there is a there is a number of people who think that uh, nuclear is the only option um, and for good reason there are there are some very very strong points in uh, favor of nuclear. Um, what, what is generally thought is that these are uh, nuclear can provide enormous quantities of very cheap energy with no emissions. It is true that it does not um, give any emissions of greenhouse gases. There is, there is some little bit of GHG emissions uh, in the construction of nuclear power plants, uh, but I think that, that applies to every form of energy. Uh, so, in, in generally the, the, the greenhouse, uh, uh, the global warming potential of nuclear energy is very low. So, we, we know how it works, uh, atoms are, uh, are split, it is a process of nuclear f uh, fission. Uh, there are also uh, concepts of nuclear fusion, but we have not been able to make uh, commercial reactors using fusion technology, wish we could, uh, but uh, not there, not there as yet. Um, common, the most common source, uh, the, the nuclear fuel that is used is uranium um, and it is mined in various parts of the world and small quantities of uranium um, in a reactor can give very large quantities of energy. 
So, um, there are some countries which, uh, which rely very heavily on uh, nuclear for their electricity, uh, but uh, in India uh, the share of nuclear is, is much smaller and world over also it is not very large because there are relatively fewer countries in the world which have uh, nuclear power. Uh, the, the costs of nuclear power generation are relatively cheap, uh, they are as uh, roughly the same as coal uh, and it does not produce uh, carbon dioxide, so that is a, uh, that's a very, uh, very strong point. The other very strong point is that once the plant is in operation it is extremely reliable. So, I, I, I talked about base load power, nuclear probably is, is, the, is the best uh, example of uh, reliable round the clock uh, base load power. Okay. But uh, the, the disadvantage is that uh, there are some very, uh, there are extreme risks associated with uh, nuclear energy in general and, uh, and that they, they come from the very closely related uh, uh, nuclear weapons, um, weapons proliferation, uh, the handling of uh, nuclear waste and possible accidents. So, uh, the nuclear industry probably in terms of safety is I think compared to the chemical industry it is by far uh, uh, better, um, but the problem is if something does go wrong uh, and the nuclear uh, waste is, uh, is going to last for, a, for an extremely long period of time. So, I, I from the point of view of a human lifespan, the there are many isotopes which are which have half lives of thousands of years. So, uh, they, they remain in the environment and that is only the half life. So, they remain in the environment for a very very long time. There are there are some isotopes which uh, which decay much faster they have uh, half lives of uh, maybe days or, or a few years. So, th that okay uh, that may be uh, an acceptable kind of risk, but with the long lived isotopes that is um, very different. Okay, so, now you may think that the safety issue is quite exaggerated and uh, that they have a very good track record, uh, but it turns out that uh, on the nuclear event scale there are the major accidents that have happened are the Fukushima uh, disaster and the Chernobyl disaster, where a lot of people have been exposed to, uh, to radiation and it is continuing. Fukushima is still uh, releasing uh, radiation uh, underground and to the ocean. So, we do not know exactly what, what the effects are going to be uh, in the long run and in the long run as far as nuclear goes is uh, you know uh, many, many half lives. So, uh, the um, some of the isotopes have already uh, died down because they had very, very short uh, half lives but then there are some, the long lived ones are a big problem. Uh, there have been nuclear plants uh, which have uh, which are quite notorious for uh, several accidents and accidental releases of radioactive uh, material that they had uh, over the world and uh, I, I have listed a few of them over here. So, if you if you look at the worldwide uh, accidents or or some major accidents and some not so major accidents at power plants, they are very small in number. So, um, uh, but, but they, they have continued to happen even after we, uh, le let us say that after Chernobyl in 1986, uh, humanity probably learnt its worst lesson, uh, but the accidents have continued even after that. So, 57 percent of the accidents have happened uh, in even the United States. Uh, it is not only like uh, these accidents happen in Soviet China or something like that. So, what I am trying to say is that uh, the accidents are, are unavoidable and they are, uh, uh, they are uh, bound to happen. The only issue is that the uh, nuclear accident has un unacceptable consequences, whereas any other uh, accident uh, you know has may have implications for that generation, but not for future generations. So, there is a, a very strong uh, uh, issue of intergenerational ethics associated with the nuclear issue. Intergenerational meaning what gives us the moral right to uh, destroy the environment or uh, put the future generations, the generations which are not even born today, 
to put their lives uh, uh, in danger or to uh, damage the environment for them. So, th these intergenerational uh, uh, ethical issues are, um, are very common in the discussion of sustainability and sustainability involves uh, the uh, such issues. So, uh, I, I told you that many other accidents happen, auto accidents happen in millions, chemical accidents happen quite frequently. Uh, the problem though is that the radioactivity related accidents can lay waste land for, for thousands of years. I mean, there is no possibility of people um, within, within our human lifespan or within a matter of centuries, which, which is what we can normally imagine. Um, there is no possibility of people colonizing that uh, place again and the effects continue over generations. Now, radioactive waste disposal has been planned very scientifically uh, by the, uh, the nuclear industry and um, there are, I, I will share some resources with you also on that. Uh, but the, uh, the long lived isotopes uh, will, will remain a concern for a very long time and they, uh, they, the, they normally vitrify the, um, the radioactive waste uh, and then they put it in these uh, canisters, uh, the steel drums and then they, uh, they plan to geologically bas basically bury it very, very deep. Uh, but it turns out that uh, they have, uh, no country has so far started doing that. I mean, the, the, all this is planned and it is set to be operational in a matter of a couple of decades. But so far, this geological storage of long term storage of uh, nuclear waste has not been done. So, um, while that has not been done, uh, there, are, there are other completely unethical things that, that have happened. And this is exactly what the, what the problem is, that the planned and good ways are, uh, are yet to see fruition, but the uh, really unethical ways have, have happened. Uh, this is an extreme case, I mean it may not be the norm, but um, uh, this uh, particular mafia clan was, was paid by uh, some countries, uh, state nuclear agencies uh, to get rid of uh, some drums filled with toxic and radioactive waste from advanced countries which we look up to. And uh, Somalia <coughs> was the destination for dumping that waste and some of it uh, has been uh, dumped uh, in the Mediterranean. So, they uh, load up ships with um, these drums and simply sink the ship, come back and claim uh, insurance uh, cover for that. So, this is, uh, these unethical things are also there. Then, uh, more recently there have, uh, there is a threat of terrorist attacks and things like that. So, uh, there, there is a clear intention to cause harm. The, um, what I am trying to um, get at is, we need to probably look for systems that are inherently rugged and uh, inherently more resilient to such issues. See, there are natural disasters, they are not in our control. Uh, wrong intentions of human beings are also not in our control. There are terrorists in the world. We are living in a real world and terrorists are there and they are bound to attack. So, having uh, a, an energy system which is vulnerable to uh, natural disasters, vulnerable to human error, vulnerable to deliberate intentional attacks uh, is, is not a secure system. So, what is uh, this physicist uh, over here says that uh, the future energy in a, in a sustainable world, for now let us leave some practical considerations aside, uh, let us think of a sustainable world, maybe a idealistic or whatever it is. Uh, but let us imagine a, a sustainable world. In that sustainable world, is it better to design uh, an, an energy infrastructure which is inherently resilient or is it better to design something that is vulnerable to attack, vulnerable to natural disasters? So, from that point of view, uh, it is better to, to have a, a decentralized system where uh, it, is, it is very difficult for a, a terrorist uh, to, uh, to attack. Uh, an entire country. You know, if, the, if, they, if they target a few nuclear installations, uh, they do not have to drop a nuclear bomb on you. Uh, they just need to uh, damage your nuclear reactors, the radiation will spread. 
so uh, this is uh, and, and that is what happened with fukushima uh, due to a natural disaster now the tsunami was nobody had imagined that a tsunami would come uh, or maybe they had imagined but they didn't they didn't think it would be that big so uh, a tsunami hit india also so uh, our fortunately our reactors uh, did not have this problem uh, but again you know accidents keep happening human error also happens chernobyl there was a human error involved nobody did it deliberately but there was error uh, so these things are uh, unavoidable so so this is where why, uh, where i'm uh, actually uh, getting to uh, i'm i'm sure you, i mean you are you are uh, free to have your own opinion about the the nuclear issue and uh, some people do are staunch believers in uh, nuclear energy and uh, uh, okay good for them uh, but so i have i have some reading material and i'll add, add some more about the pros and cons of nuclear energy uh, you can it's a, it's a hyperlink uh, you can you can click on it and then refer to it and then there are there is the world nuclear association also they have they have described it very well um, the um, the way they uh, plan to uh, uh, the long term storage of nuclear waste and things like that there are some countries which want the storage to be retrievable so future generations if they want to use uh, those waste for some uh, uh, purpose um, then uh, they they should have the the ability to do that so some countries want a retrievable storage some countries uh, do not want it retrievable because by when it is not retrievable it is more secure okay we looked at fossil fuels and we saw that there are problems then we looked at nuclear and we saw some of those problems hydroelectric is uh, a uh, a renewable form of energy because you know water uh, water is um, uh, renewed every year through the water cycle and you have the dam the reservoirs that get filled up in the in the rainy season and then they get uh, used up uh, during the rest of the year so hydroelectric is uh, a renewable source of energy it is also a conventional form of energy we presently do use a lot of hydroelectric power so uh, why not simply scale that up there are issues the socio environmental issues which i have discussed with you but in general hydroelectric is a very good idea because it has once constructed it has low running costs uh, there is uh, no waste or pollution after the initial phase uh, in the initial phase uh, during submergence of land there may be methane emissions um, once functional it, it gives very high reliability the electricity is highly dispatchable so dispatchable meaning it can be uh, the production can be stepped up and stepped down at a very short notice to match the demand so this is a this is a very uh, very important advantage of that and uh, in fact in a in a in a sustainable energy infrastructure hydroelectric can play a very important role and i'm going to show you Uh, even a video and an animation on that so this basically uh, brings me to the uh, to the end of uh, this uh, this session i know we have a little bit of time and i have something planned for that okay mepco shlank shivakashi yeah hi i'd like to i'd like to know what what you have uh, yeah. written down in terms of uh, some things that you you agree or plan to do uh, related to the water issue what's the difference between the perpetual resources and the energy resources okay renewable are things that get consumed but get replenished due to uh, the uh, the various processes in the biosphere and perpetual is uh, which is always there solar energy is always there mufakam ja hyderabad sir my question is generally we are using silicon plates to capture sunlight or solar energy what is the main reason behind using the silicon and one more question is what are the other alternatives apart from silicon uh, there are there are various technologies yes silicon uh, solar cells are the the main uh, technology for photovoltaics it has been around for a very long time uh, but there are many other alternative technologies uh, i i will not get time to cover all that uh, you can a simple search on the internet will pull up many things you have cadmium telluride you have dye sensitized solar cells you have um, uh, copper indium gallium arsenide so many things are uh, there uh, many technologies are are there in our college we are having a permeable pavement uh, 
for recharging the aquifers ground water aquifers and also in our home we are having uh, percolation pit uh, for recharging the aquifers with the rain water uh, we are planning to have in our college also this type of pit where the rain water falls actually to the ground where it reaches to the ground uh, this type of things actually recharges the aquifer so uh, we will not have a scarcity during uh, summer season right excellent do you remember that video i showed you about uh, bangalore uh, the rooftop on bangalore see how much that gentleman was able to do but at least everybody ah. each one of us can at least conserve the water usage right we can we can limit our water use we all get a water bill mm. right so we know how many liters we are we are being charged for with this activity uh, this year we are not having any scarcity of water from our bore uh, it is practical also this year we had a very good result with that uh, percolation pit actually excellent that is very nice mm. thank you thank you sir techno india salt lake kolkata so the i would like to uh, basically spread awareness among each and every individual in our area so that uh, water is spent less if we belong to west bengal where there is no dearth of water as such because we have the hugli flowing by yes. so we personally i also never ever have i mean we, the awareness is not in us when we enter the washroom we kind of accept that water is a free commodity like so if we can personally like spread this awareness i think it will be a great move in the long run i think water quality issues are there everywhere i mean although there may be a, there may not be a water availability issue in west bengal but water quality issues are definitely there i presume so maybe yeah, something uh, where, could be done yeah, in that big, area yeah and in big condominiums where there is a urban populace like uh, we are all aware of these issues so therefore such sort of rain harvesting which is not quite common in our areas can easily be done this is also an awareness which we can start at our areas and neighborhood this is what i feel okay excellent thank you so much knowledge institute how is the geothermal energy is used to produce electricity sir can you more emphasize on that yeah geothermal energy uh, the the reason i did not uh, see because we have many things to cover so i had to choose what to cover what not to cover geothermal energy is is great where it is available but it is not available everywhere so in india there are there are relatively fewer sites where you you get geo, geothermal energy so the overall geothermal energy potential is somewhat lower uh, they, there are other places in the world where it is high so basically you have heated rocks uh, beneath the earth surface so uh, the that heat is used to generate steam so water is forced down uh, in, into that strata and heated steam is recovered from another uh, bore and uh, the, that steam is used to uh, at high pressure and that steam is uh, used to rotate turbines so again there are no op major operational costs uh, the, the there is no uh, there is no fuel as such the the earth's heat is the fuel so um, in that sense geothermal is is a great idea and it is uh, uh, it's a very good option where uh, there is geothermal potential thank you sir we are producing the individual home to produce the rain water harvesting tank right to improve the implementing in our house to improve the ground water level sir okay so so you are going to harvest rain water from the roof and then recharge it uh, to the aquifer okay that's nice so any have you planned any anything to do with your students yes sir we can producing uh, we have many projects sir make a product project yeah, i am from mass knowledge institute technology civil engineering department so our students they did one project uh, regarding that uh, most of the ground area is covered only by road concrete surface road and bitumen road so in that the most of the rain water is going accumulating into the drainage that water get wasted which is uh, combined with drainage no so our student what uh, did one project uh, below the bitumen surface or concrete surface we kept on a filtration bed out of that there will be voids or pores inside that through the rain water will get the goes into the filtration and then it will directly go to the ground surface and, th and that will be increase the ground water uh, level of that uh, surrounding area uh, that is one of the project we have did and it is implemented in some uh, in our college campus it is in process right now sir it's wonderful it is for road surface 
Thank you so Thank much you for sir. sharing Thank it. You. Tejpur University. Uh, sir, yesterday you were talking about this uh, sanitation program and you were comparing India with China and Bangladesh. Yes. And you said that uh, for san in sanitation, India is lagging behind. Yes. And at the same time, you were talking about water conservation. Yes. So, for sanitation, sir, we need lot of water. Yes. In my opinion, this is contradiction. So, what do you feel for this? Yes, good point. I, I, uh, I, I am a little uh, surprised that the message did not go through because I had, I had uh, juxtaposed these two things only to bring out this, this contradiction. Uh, now, the, the issue is if you have uh, at, at one end, we, we require sanitation and sanitation needs more water, so we, it, it worsens the water crisis. So, that is why I said that there are alternative ways of uh, providing uh, effluent treatment as well as, so th with watershed management, uh, if you, you can make more water available and that water which has been made available can be used in an efficient way. So, rather than flushing down good drinking quality water in most of our cities, there is only one quality of water which is, uh, which is supposed to be drinking quality water. Um, and that is what we, we fill in our overhead tanks and that is what we flush down the toilet also. So, that, that is not a very intelligent way of uh, using uh, water. So, that is why I showed you examples of grey water recycling and of even to the extreme uh, extent of uh, dry composting toilets. So, dry composting toilets do not require uh, any water. If we are in the conventional mindset, where uh, uh, sanitation or a toilet means uh, the, the, the kind of flush toilets that we are used to, then it, it leads to a problem. But there are alternatives. And moreover, even if you are using water, but that water is recycled grey water, recycled grey water is, is, is okay to flush. You do not require uh, high quality water to, to flush down the toilet. So, alternatives are there. In fact, in my talk itself, I have given alternatives and there are people are very innovative, we just have to look around. There are so many excellent examples in this country and, and outside of this country that people have, have come up with. So, we should uh, among the various options available, which are the ones that we choose and adopt? The choice is in our hands. So, I am so no. glad that you pointed out uh, this thing that contradiction was deliberately there and in fact, I thought that I had brought out the contradiction. But it now, now it appears to me that that contradiction was not brought out effectively. So, that I, I take the blame for that, that I was not able to successfully communicate that. Sir, the uh, one thing I am, I would like to ask you in this presentation, uh, one thing uh, when, when, we, uh, when I will go and tease this topic of energy, uh, what will be the future for the energy? Because each uh, source of energy has some pros and cons. Nuclear energy has some uh, positive and advantage, disadvantage, hydroelectric, thermal. But what, what will be the future? What is the solution? That is something is missing in this presentation, which I feel that uh, what will our vehicle happen when the, all the fossil fuel exhausted? Yeah, good question. Let us no, consult an astrologer. <laughs> what will the future be? No, my, my, this is only one session. I have the next session in which I am going to talk about solutions. Thank you. Thank you so much.